welcome to phase three on communication. This is going to be the most fun phase out of all of the phases because we are going to learn how to effectively communicate our value proposition. We're going to address case studies. So how do you make a uh, format a case study and how do you properly communicate that case study? You're going to be getting practice on that. How do you effectively communicate your treatment plan? So starting with your goals, creating a treatment plan, and then your interventions, how do you communicate that to your patient, to other professionals? The third stage is scope of practice. You're going to learn how to communicate your scope of practice to other professionals. And then finally, you're going to be able to communicate your professional value to a range of audiences. Always remember that there are challenges associated with this program. If you have not already, please, please, please catch up on your challenges. Engagement is huge. We can only get out of this experience what we put into it. And I want you guys to benefit from all of the knowledge that is in this course and all of the potential for engagement and professional networking that this course offers. So please do engage and then finally ask questions if you have them. And that could be clinical questions um, unrelated to the content. That could be uh, school questions, you know, things that maybe a dilemma you're facing. Please do share that openly in the Q&A so that we can all benefit from that Q&A. You can know all the things but if you can't effectively communicate them, your knowledge is lost to everyone. Being able to articulate your ideas is a high level skill that we just don't have enough time practicing. It is what it is. Our OT programs out there, they just don't have enough time. There is not enough time under the sun to give you practice on everything you're going to need to implement in clinical practice, especially when it comes to communication. Getting enough time practicing different scenarios and role playing and knowing how to respond when you come face to face with some of these challenges, we don't have enough time to practice that because our uh, academic curriculum is so rigorous. There is just not, you know, there's not enough time. Not that they don't want to give that to you, but uh, there truly is just nowhere to fit it. And that's why we're doing this right now. We need to practice. We have to practice. If we don't practice, we will never improve. And uh, the more we practice, right, the less difficulty we will have actually speaking up and out about the things that the OT, um, the OT profession values. So what is the biggest roadblock with public speaking? And this could be to an audience of one, it could be an audience of five or less, or you could be speaking to an audience of 50 or more, right? It really doesn't matter. The point is communication is difficult. Communicating at any level about a topic that you may or may not be confident with is difficult. So what are some of the reasons why someone is uh, fearful of public speaking? Fear of failure, lack of confidence, negative past experiences, fear of rejection, anxiety about the attention being on you, perfectionism, fear of forgetting, fear of criticism, social anxiety, posture, <laughs> I did it, I uh, imposter syndrome, I noticed that earlier and that was not changed feeling unprepared and pressure to perform. I would love if you pause this video right here and just head to the community real quick. You can open it up in a separate tab and just kind of um, make a post that you are watching the phase three introduction video and you want to share what elements of public speaking fears you relate most to. I relate to almost all of them in some way, but I'd like you to choose one or two if it, if they apply to you and go ahead and let your, your cohort in on that. Being vulnerable and getting used to sharing 
where you're at is really important in community because it allows you to see that you're not alone. Most likely there are other people with those same fears and it allows those people to encourage you. And we, we can't do this alone, okay? We're not an island. So like I said, most of these fears apply to me. Um, and in terms of a personal example, I did wanna share that with you because I thought back in another life, this was back before 2010 when I graduated with my English degree, uh, here I am. And I thought I was going to be a political science major. I was going to be an activist. You know, I was going to be an author who had an opinion about everything and communicated uh, strongly and, you know, all of these things. So I majored in public speaking and communication. Well, here's my thing. When it came down to it, I realized that I am scared to death, <laughs> that I am completely paralyzed by my social anxiety, that I cannot keep, uh, communicate confidently, I cannot articulate my thoughts well, I can't remember my words when I'm in front of an audience, everything just turns into a puddle, and that public speaking just was not for me. This, this presentation, I just remember it so vividly, I had a four minute presentation. So it was, it was in a group and each of us had four minutes and the rules were that you had four minutes to speak. You could be within five seconds either way of your time frame, but you had to pace yourself so that you were four minutes speaking time plus or minus five. Well, I was super confident. I knew the material. I could I could talk in front of a mirror for the full four minutes and without an issue, right? I practiced. I didn't need a visual aid. That's that's what I told myself. Well, I don't need cue cards. I don't need, you know, to make post, you know, little post-it cards. I don't need any of that because I have it under control. I will be a persuasive speaker. I got in front of this audience and I spoke for a minute and like seven seconds. It was a little over a minute and the clock ran and I stood there in silence, in absolute silence for the rest of the time because the time had to run itself down. Uh, we weren't allowed to just move on. Uh, we had to live in that uncomfortable feeling. It was horrible. Um, so what I did was I changed majors. I was like, well, verbal communication is not for me. So let's, let's do written communication. I'm interested in that as well. So that must be where my future is sending me. And so, so I dropped out of that class and I became an English major and that was my first degree. So what changed? How did I go from this person um, who completely bombed and failed her, her public speaking opportunity to an individual who is presenting in front of huge audiences. Well, I can tell you that my fears haven't gone away. I am still extremely nervous. That has not ever changed. I'm scared. I'm scared of criticism. I'm, I'm scared of controversy. I'm, I, I have fears. Okay, those remain. However, I've learned how to cope with them. I've learned that the good of presenting and the goodness that comes from pushing beyond my comfort zone to speak, the good outweighs the challenge, uh, the, the bad, the difficulty. So as I took this journey through English and uh, through my, I, I worked for several years before I went back to school, I had more and more opportunity to develop myself personally and professionally. I took time to develop my skills. I continuously pushed myself out of my comfort zone until I got to the point that I could tolerate speaking in front of a group and I knew how to 
master the content so that I didn't ever have one of those uh, silent moment episodes again. Uh, so that is how that happened. All this to say is you too will evolve if, if you put the time into it. When you have challenges and you'll see the challenges coming up that ask you to post a video instead of using the text format, do that. If, you'll, if you feel uncomfortable, I would ask you to take advantage of that opportunity to live outside of your comfort zone. Why is it important for occupational therapy practitioners to improve their communication skills? Well, it improves effective communication with clients. It's educating and empowering patients, building trust and rapport, interdisciplinary collaboration, advocating for the profession, teaching and training, presenting research and evidence-based practices, community outreach and health promotion, and professional growth and career advancement. You need communication skills for everything. You may not be speaking from a, a podium, right? You may not be speaking at a conference or speaking to, speaking at a rally or, or whatever it might be, but you do work in a profession that requires constant communication. You will present information to other medical professionals. You will be put in a position where you are presenting an in-service. That is just what naturally takes place in the course of an occupational therapy career. And so communication skills is going to be very important for you. Some public speaking considerations. Use language conventions appropriate to the task, purpose, and audience. So what do I mean by language conventions? Fluent and precise articulation, strategically varying volume and pitch, and learning how to pace yourself in order to engage listeners. You know what this means. You know those speakers who just speak wicked fast, like they speak super fast, and they're not pacing themselves, and they're so nervous when they're speaking that they don't have the ability to pause and ask questions or pause and engage the audience. I am that speaker sometimes. Sometimes I have great presentations and I do very well. And sometimes I completely, completely uh, miss the mark on my presentation. So, you know, it comes in waves, but it's important um, as a communicator to, to incorporate those language conventions and nonverbal gestures and body language are equally as important. We, as occupational therapy practitioners, pride ourselves on using therapeutic use of self. I actually believe that's one of our cornerstones in the new OTPF is our ability to use therapeutic use of self. So in speaking about that, learning how to um, control nonverbal gestures and use them uh, to facilitate engagement and facilitate healing, that's something that's extremely important. And that's why face-to-face -face, uh, time, even asynchronous video uh, mediums, that's fine. But it's a way for you to, for others to see your nonverbal gestures and to see how you present the information, both in your verbal and nonverbal communication um, uh, elements. So throughout this phase, you're going to have access to several PDFs. The case studies handbook, which is 28 pages, you're going to have options to do some of the challenges by using those case studies if you do not have one of your own. Case study planning sheet, activity analysis illustration, treatment planning communication sheet, an activity analysis toileting example, and protecting professional autonomy. There are some additional PDFs that have been put into these modules, so do take a look at the bottom of each module. You will see where the links are for that. Here is the pathway and the outline for this course. You're, you see that there's 10 major themes within this, this stage, I'm sorry, within this phase, and you're going to have uh, at least five challenges that you can complete. Always remember to check back into the challenges because there may be some challenges that don't uh, specifically relate to the Connect Mentorship Program, but that are there as an option for you to engage. 
Okay. Well, I hope you are caught up on your challenges and I hope that you are ready for the next four stages of communication. I cannot wait to uh, watch you grow through this. Mm -hmm.